Welcome, y'all. That was good. Donnie, thanks. You're back. That trip to the emergency room uh, worked out pretty well. Okay. I don't know about y'all. A lot of folks I know that have been suffering from the flu. Y'all, we have a special speaker today. You have heard him before, but today is extra special. The man was born in Florence, Alabama. How many people know where Florence is? Okay, how many people were born in Florence? <laughs> All right, look at that, look at that, okay. Okay, he went to the University of Alabama and majored in history, our own Steve Graham. You may have recognized him, okay. Somehow, he was able to convince the saintly, the beautiful, the charming, the intelligent, the marathon long distance runner, Casey Heath, to marry him. Now she goes by Kathy, Casey Heath Graham, is that right? Okay, good. Somehow, Steve was able to come here today to speak while his wife is running in the Mercedes Marathon and oldest daughter. Okay. Uh, Chris has four children. Chris, about 24, these are approximate ages. Abby, 22. Molly, a senior now, and she is the class president, is that right? Vestavia High Class President. Okay, congratulations. All right. Riley, 15. Steve is in the drug business. Now, we won't go into the drug business. Yes. Uh, you can meet him in the parking lot, right? No. If you have any trouble with your drug prescriptions, just see this man right after class. He works for AstraZeneca. He's a pharmaceutical salesman. A football fan known to root for the University of Alabama. Of course, everybody roots for them now since they did win the national championship. Please help me welcome a man known for the bumper sticker. It would have been a lot more popular except it was a little too long. The quote, if I knew how many people would be interested in history, I would have paid more attention. Our own Steve Graham. Good morning. Good to see everyone. And uh, if you have your Bibles or your Bible app, uh, if you would go ahead and open to Luke chapter 10. That's where we'll spend uh, our time together this morning. While you're turning there, uh, I will want to thank Russ, uh, as always, for the opportunity to stand before you. Um, I actually manage a team of salespeople. 11 salespeople in Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, and the panhandle of Florida. And if I just had one that could close the deal the way that Russ Brown can close the deal, uh, I'd, I'd be much more successful at leading my sales team. But uh, it's, always, it's always a pleasure uh, to, to, to be up here and be part of this class. Donnie, great job with the songs this morning. It always, it always takes me back, and M Molly is my daughter that's here this morning. Uh, and I, I always lean over to her when we sing those old hymns and I tell her, this, I can hear Mamaw singing, you know, who's God rest her soul. Uh, but I love those old songs because they, they take you back to a time and a place, right? Uh, and I also want to just uh, recognize and thank all of you and really just the entire church here. I was thinking this week, this is uh, three, week, three years ago this, this week is when our family joined the, the church family here. Uh, at Homewood. And so what a blessing it's been really for all of us from the youngest to the oldest, which would be myself. And um, it's, just a, it's just an honor and a blessing to be part of, of this group here. And um, one thing we try to do, we, we try to jump in uh, and get involved wherever we can. Uh, we, we made a purposeful decision for the first couple of years. To, we, we refused to turn down any invitation. Uh, that's the fastest way to get to know, know new people. So um, it's, just, it's just been great being a part of Homewood. So um, looking at Luke chapter 10, um, we're going to begin in verse 25, so I'll call your attention there. But before we do that, I just want to kind of bridge from this morning's sermon to here, because I'm so glad that Brett taught what he, what he did today and really brought up the idea, the concept of letting, allowing things to become dull. Okay, because I think what can happen to us often when we're reading, reading things that we've read all of our life, ever since we were in four-year-old, uh, children's church, is that sometimes they can become dull to us, even some of the greatest stories, some of the greatest parables. And so I would just encourage you as we read through this, try to, 
Try to have your eyes opened again to the, to the wonder and the amazement, as Brett was talking about, of, of such a time. So let me just set the stage for you before we start reading. I think another thing that happens sometimes is as we read this, the accounts of Jesus in the four Gospels, sometimes I, I, I know this is the case for me, sometimes I allow myself to not see the, the grandness of it all. Jesus wasn't just some sort of crazy guy or half crazy guy uh, who was with a ragtag bunch who was just sort of on the fringe. He was, at this point, he was becoming the most popular man on the globe. Okay? It, it, just one chapter before in Luke chapter 9, there was a, there was a crowd of 5,000 people that he fed because they were just following him on his journey because he wasn't just staying still in one town. He was moving, moving around. And, the, and the, he was becoming epic. And so when I, I, I tried to teach my kids and when I used to teach Bible classes to, to uh, high school or junior high age, I wanted them to, to see it for what it was. it was. It was big. This was something big that was happening. Okay? So let's pick up in verse 25. And what we're reading about here is the Good Samaritan, the parable of the Good Samaritan. On one occasion... An expert in the law stood up to, to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law? He replied, how do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he, wanting to justify himself, asked Jesus, and who is my name? Read this parable that was told by Jesus. Now, it's also probably the most famous, the most um, known, the most celebrated of all the parables that Jesus told. And I think we can, we can see that even as we fast forward about 2,000 years from the time that it was told on earth, we see it manifest in today's society in, in myriad ways. In our everyday parlance, to start with, if Steve Castleman's here today, and if Steve Castleman's driving down the, the I-459 and he passes someone who's, it's obviously they've got car trouble on the side of the road, gets off of the next exit, turns around, and then takes them back the same exit to go back and help them. He's being a good Samaritan. It's in our everyday parlance, uh, things, uh, things that, how we might describe someone who helps strangers in need. It's in our art. Uh, it's in our mosaics of of some of the, the oldest, most historic uh, houses of worship throughout our country and really across the globe, if you go into an Episcopal church or, a, or a, a Catholic church, a lot of times they'll have stained glass windows like we have here, but they'll use them to depict stories from the Bible, especially from the Gospels. Almost all of them have this, this parable depicted in one of those, those stained glass windows. We see it in our hospitals. We see it in our... Uh, Organizations of charity and, our, and benevolence. The Good Sam, or the Samaritan's Purse, I think, is one of, the, one of the most widely known benevolent organizations. So this this is a parable that is really, really ingrained into our, our culture even today. And there are many obvious lessons uh, that we could take from this, and, and some of them we'll hit on this morning. Um, but what I'd really like us to do in, in the time that we have remaining, and, and just to check, Russ, is, is the bell at 11.30? Okay, gotcha. Uh, we're going to unpack the characters in this story. We're just going to kind of slow down with the parable, try to dig into it a little further than just kind of the, the obvious lessons. Let's unpack each of these characters as they occur and maybe try to look into why is the Lord using this, this character as an example in this story. Okay, so going back up to the top of, of, the, of the account, the first uh, character we're introduced to and really, probably the most important one is the man that he's talking to, the expert in the law, as, as, as he's called, the scribe. We see these kind of encounters with Jesus throughout the Gospels. A man stands up to put him to the test, to try to tempt Jesus, to try to bait him, to trap him. Okay, that's, that's what I think we can infer, uh, is that before he even spoke, where was his heart? Was he really seeking to learn from Jesus? I, I, stand, I, I can't stand in judgment of any man, much less this man. But I think it's fair to infer that his heart per, perhaps was not in the right place. He was seeking to test and tempt, tempt the Lord. So you see, um, 
He says, teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And how does Jesus respond to it? Jesus uses what we have now today come to know as the Socratic method. In, in other words, responding to a question with a question. Put the, put the debate, the argument, the question back to the, to the one who poses uh, the original question. And what he does in this is so brilliant. Jesus is the best that's ever been at everything, but one thing he was really good at was debating those who thought they were the best at debating. Okay? And so what he does when he uses this method to put it back to, to, the, to the scribe, he also uses the law as the basis of the, retor- of the return question and, and positions himself as now Jesus will be the one that's in the position to evaluate the response. It's brilliant. And so then the scribe, he's no novice at this, right? How does he respond? He responds, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. In your text, as you're looking or reading, it probably has quotations around those. That's because the scribe is directly quoting Deuteronomy 6, chapter 6, verse 5, which is the first part, and then Leviticus 19, which is the second part of the love your neighbor as yourself. And so verse 28 is a key. After he responds, how does Jesus respond back? He doesn't just try to argue with him, but he uses his answer to make the point. He affirms that what the man has told him and how he has responded is correct, but then he carries it forward, which is kind of what, the, what Jesus came to do with the old to make it new. He affirms, and then he carries it forward with a challenge. Do this. Practice it. Go and, and put this into your life and do this every day with everyone you come into contact with. That's what he's communicating. But it's not over yet because the scribe, <clears throat> seeking personal justification, and you can almost just sense the smugness at this point. Because again, setting the stage, remembering the, the, the hugeness of this all. This isn't just a couple of guys sitting at a table alone. There is an audience around this. There is a crowd. And so you can just imagine the scribe, I don't want to be embarrassed here. I don't want, I don't want to lose this debate. And so he tries to drill down a little further with a little smugness probably. And who is my neighbor? So I think it's important that we pause there to understand the importance of this because take yourself into the Hebrew culture, into the Hebrew uh, uh, religion of the day. A neighbor, officially in the Hebrew language, was someone that you have an association with. Okay, so what I believe was likely occurring here is that the scribe was likely seeking to justify his limited version, his limited understanding, his limited definition of neighbor which was an exclusionary definition. It was excluded Samaritans, excluded Romans, excluded foreigners, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It was very closed in a box, as Brett described today. So um, that is how he responds. And so at this point, this is a, this is a huge, huge moment right here because Jesus has, has led, even though he didn't initiate the conversation. He has led the conversation to this point. And now the ball's back in Jesus' court of, of the conversation, and he's about to go to work. And he does it the way he always, almost always does it. He's the greatest storyteller of all time. And we immediately go into a story. And here we are introduced to our second character of this account. Jesus begins the parable by introducing us to the victim. Of the, of the parable. A man traveling the Jericho Road. He's assumed to be a layman Jew. I think we can just make that assumption. I, I, we don't know if, what exactly his race or religion was, but I think we can make the assumption since he was departing Jerusalem, it's probably safe to assume that Jesus was describing just a, a, a regular average Jewish man. Okay, and we, we read very clearly he was robbed of everything, he was stripped beaten with an inch of his life, and abandoned in the ditch. And so I think it's important that we, we, we kind of focus in on this road, too, the Jericho Road. The Jerusalem to Jericho Road was known to just be a, a really treacherous, winding road. I believe it was called the, the Way of Blood 
in, in, at the time. Um, th this is where these types of, of, of folks, robbers, thieves, just bad dudes, they hung out on this road because it was, it was easy picking, right? And so I believe by Jesus selecting this as, the, as kind of the, the place in his story, it speaks to the scribe and to his entire audience. It puts them into a place that they can see. They can see it. They can understand. They comprehend what, this, what the basis of this story is. And so now we're at the point of the story where there, so this man is just, I mean, he's, he's, he's almost dead. He's laying in the ditch. He's naked. Um, and he's on probably the worst road in all of Galilee. And along comes our second character, the priest. We're not really told a lot about the priest. There's really no description other than that he showed no compassion, zero compassion. And if there's any character in this entire parable that understood the law, this is a man of the law. If anyone would have understood what the scribe, the verse from Leviticus that the scribe had responded back to Jesus, the importance of that, love your neighbor as yourself, it would have been this man. It would have been the priest, right? But we're also told this, and catch this, this is important too. It says that he passed by on the other side so as not to defile himself, right? Priests had so many stringent legal restrictions on them. And so they were so consumed by that that they couldn't see the broader, they were so consumed with the minors that they couldn't see the major, right? So the priest moves on his way. Now we get to the next character we're introduced to, which is the Levite. You would think that this, this is almost just a, a repeat of, of the first one we're introduced to, which is the priest, but I think it's done for emphasis by the Lord. And again, we see no compassion on the part of the Levite. We see the same behavior all the way to passing on the other side. But why this character? Why is this character introduced by the Lord in this parable? He's already kind of made that point with the priest. Well, it's important because... Levites were of what tribe? Levi. And what, what important duties was the tribe of Levi given? Way back in the Old Testament times, when the tribes were broken out. Right, and, and Levi, they were given the special duty of all of them were to assist the priests in the temple, right? So this is just another example uh, that, that really shows that both of these characters, in my opinion, represent the hypocrisy of religious authority and legalism. And I think that's a lesson with the whale because it says he had to go through Samaria. And if you look at a map, it makes sense to go through Samaria. Um, but I think Jesus, it, throughout the Gospels, he's always seeking out Samaritans. Uh, and I believe in this passage of Luke 10, right before that, um, or maybe it's right before, I think, where he sends them into a Samaritan village and the Samaritans turn him away because they're worried that he's on his way to Jerusalem. And, and there's all this kind of back history, century after century of the Samaritans just being viewed as garbage. And why is that? Well, it's because they had intermarried over the years, intermarried with non-Jews, and they did not keep all the law, particularly what Brett was talking about today, especially around the Sabbath. Their worship practices had, had altered over the centuries. And so the most orthodox of Jews viewed them as low class, okay? Um, but here's where we come to this verse where the Samaritan is introduced and says that he came as his way, on his, on his way, he saw him, okay? And this is a key. This is the differentiating factor between this character and the previous two. When he saw him, he had pity on him. He had compassion on him. And I think this is a good place for us to reflect on our own lives, We've probably been all of these characters at some point. There have been times when we have happened upon someone in a circumstance and we've been the priest or the Levite because we've got places to go or, you know, I don't have time to stop or it's dangerous places, it's a dangerous intersection, dangerous part of town, which Jericho Road. Um, and then there have been times where we've been the Samaritan up until this point where we looked on someone and had compassion but, comma, we're, too, we're in too much of a hurry. Or maybe we've been the priest and we've judged. Well, they probably put themselves in that situation, right? 
Or if I, if I help them, they're only going to use it for bad deeds because look at where they are already. There's a lot of justification that we use. But this is the critical point for the Samaritan right here because when he saw him, he had compassion and he had zero concern for the man, the man in the ditch. He had zero concern for the man in the ditch's race, his religion, his creed within the Jewish faith. And catch this one too, this was important. He had zero concern for how the man might view him. He just went into action, right? He went into action. And it's easy to talk about religion. It's easy to debate. It's easy uh, to study Scripture and to quote Scripture and all those sorts of things. But sometimes you got to, you got to put it in gear. you got to go to work. you got to do things. you got to turn your faith into action. And so just look at the things that this man did. Oil to ease his pain. Wine to disinfect the wounds. Transports the man to safety on his own animal. Pays the innkeeper with his own money. Stays the night with him to nurse him. Pays more to the innkeeper for his lodging and continued care. And promises to pay him even more. This is the third time he's going to lay out cash to help a man. He doesn't even know who he is. This is the third time he's going to lay out cash upon his return. And obviously the innkeeper trusted this man, so he probably has a history of some sort with this inn or this innkeeper. Again, it's a, it's a parable, but still, I think the point can be made. And so, Jesus stops the story right there. We don't know in, in, within the parable what happens to the man. Does he survive? Does he, does he change? Does, you know, do we learn more about the rest of the Samaritan's life? None of that, because that's not what's important here. Jesus stops the story and comes back to the most important character in the, in the story, and that is who? It's the scribe. That's the expert in the law, Right? and all the audience that's around him that's observing this. <clears throat> and Jesus just poses the final question of this conversation. Who among them proved, all caps, proved to be a neighbor? And how does the, the expert in the law respond? What could he not say? He couldn't bring himself to say the Samaritan, likely because of the hardness of his heart, the hardness of the heart that had built and encrusted for years within the, the, the culture that he had been in of I've got to be right, and what's most important for me to be right is for someone to be wrong. Someone's got to be on the wrong side of this to justify myself. And likely because of the hardness of his heart, he simply could say, the man who helped him. So, Let's look at some takeaways of this. <clears throat> religious hypocrisy, we mentioned that earlier, religious hypocrisy and legalism, I, I believe, is shown in what I call the soft villains of this story. They didn't necessarily purposely do anything wrong, but they, were, they, they simply did nothing to help. And I believe that, that speaks to what we see often uh, in the religious world and why so many doubt so many turn away. I don't think it's that they doubt so much that, they, that God is God, but I think sometimes they doubt God's people. Another takeaway, natural and proper for us to see the lessons through the actions of the Samaritan. I'm not going to focus on that today because I think those are obvious. We've learned those our entire life. But one thing I do want to throw in, I think this is important. The Samaritan had some money. Okay? And I think... What I'm about to say, I don't practice, yet I have a wife and three daughters, so what shall I do? But I believe that we should consider being purposeful, intentional about having money to help others. Add an extra you know, byline on your budget, some Samaritan line. That way you've got the money, you're being intentional about, I want to have this money so that when I do come into contact, when I have opportunities put in front of me, that I will have that to, to, to put to exercise. And we, we walk with a church family here that says, I'll walk next to you and pay half of it. Share the joy. I guarantee you, if, if just all of us in this room would do that starting in 2018, we probably wouldn't run a surplus. we share the joy. But again, I'm preaching to myself, first of all, on this. So, and, and thank God that 
that we have a church that is, is always looking to help others as, as a collective group. I'm honored to, to walk side by side with my brother Willie uh, Chrisman as we've, we've, we've started the, uh, the outreach ministry. And it's just fantastic. It's just, it, we, we're able to do, and it's, not, it's to God's glory and to, to, the, to uh, the credit of the church and all the volunteers, but we're able to be purposeful and intentional you know, about the things. And it all started with what? Money. I got, not to say money's too important, but you got to have resources. And you got to make the de- determination that we are going to be about this business. And if we're going to do that business, we got to have resources. And the church body said, through the, through the shepherds who blessed us to start this ministry, it all flows that way. And it's just a beautiful thing. So I just want to make that point, though. Don't let that be missed on you. The Samaritan, he was intentional. And he was intentional because he had made the decisions before to, to not spend everything that he had. But a more profound uh, lesson than just looking at what the Samaritan did, I think, is, and that I think perhaps what Jesus profoundly wants the scribe to see and his audience that's around the scribe at the time, and I think even us here today, is to see lessons through the, through the view from the ditch. Okay? I think it's, it's, it's within all of us. We want to be good people. We want to be the Samaritan. That's a natural thing. We never want to be the guy in the ditch. We try to, we, we work our entire life avoiding being that guy. We try to take all these safety measures. But friends, I'm telling you, we will be the man of the ditch at some point. We will be. And are we ready to be assisted? Are we ready to be rescued? Are we willing to accept it? That's the great question. Or do we, as Brett said, he used this exact quote because I went back and watched it. Do we sometimes dismiss somebody because they're within a certain category? And we're not looking for them to be our rescuer. We wouldn't want them to be our rescuer. Is that, the, is that the view from the ditch with this man? Is that our view when we find ourselves in the ditch? So, and I've got just a few minutes left, but I want to tell you a quick story. This is not a parable because every bit of this is true. I have, I have a witness who was with me. Uh, they're part of it. My oldest daughter, Abby, her car was stolen back in December while she was up in Nashville. The car was recovered about three or four days later. Her, her young uh, suitor, Will Hudson, um, the son of William and Ann Hudson, um, he, he rode with me from Birmingham up to, to Nashville to, to retrieve her car. We spent about two hours at the, at the Nashville uh, impound lot trying to get that thing to crank, to get the battery, because they had driven it until it ran out of gas and they probably left everything on and the battery was cold, right? So, I mean, we're there for an hour to two hours, and the thing just won't hold a charge. We can get it to crank, but it won't hold a charge, and we can't figure out why, and usually it's when we start moving. Now, some of you that are a little more mechanically inclined than me probably already know where this might be going, but I don't know this yet. But what I do know is I'm in a bad side of Nashville. Sun's going down. It's the shortest days of the year at this point, right? Everything's gone perfectly up to this point because, you know, I'm in charge, and this, we got this, everything's going right. The people at the impound yard are really gracious to us. They help us a lot. But we reach a point where a decision has to be made. And I look at Will and I say, you drive my car. I'm going to drive this. And we got to, if I can just get it out on the highway, it ought to hold the charge. So we take off and uh, we get uh, probably two miles down the road. And I get on this road and I know I've got to make this left turn in this left turn lane. And I get there and it's, and it's red. As I'm pulling into the turn lane, dead on Hillsborough Pike, Highway 70. And so I've already done this 20 times back in the lot. I get out, can't even turn the flashers on. There is no battery. There's no, no flashers. So I get out. I try to just stop so that enough, there's enough room for other cars to get in the turn lane and turn. But I just get out because I don't have flashers on. I need to let people know to go around. About that time, Will comes in, uh, and he, he pulls up, and I'm like, go back and see if you can get that jump box, portable charger. So he goes back, and I'm sitting there, you know, just letting people know to go around. People are passing. Nobody's stopping. I, 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 and so Will, I think, uh, knows to just abandon that idea. And I'm like, yeah, it won't, I can't get it to crank or anything. It won't hold a charge. He's like, we'll push you over there. So we had to push through the left-hand turn on Hillsborough Pike. So I'm like, okay. So I get back in, put it in neutral. Well, they're not going to push with their hands. They put the truck up against Abby's car and just push it. And I'm like, at this point, I'm like, I don't care. I'm probably going to file a claim anyway, so let's just go. So 
we, we get it out of the road. First situation, alleviated. We get over in this parking lot, and again, it's like 4.30 in the afternoon. It's starting to get dark now. These two guys hop out, and I told you that they were Hispanic. Didn't think anything of, of it at that point, but I'll, I'll tell you where I became that guy in the ditch. They get out, and I mean, they are tatted up, fingers, teardrop, forehead, through the hair. You can imagine what a... We've all seen the, the MSNBC or the NBC News specials on whatever. So your mind goes there. And they hop out, and, and they immediately go to work. They're like, what's going... You know, like, so we lift up the hood, they go to work, and, and I'm sitting back there, and they'll mess with it. They, pour, they, had a, they had a Coke, they poured their Coke over it. They start rubbing it with something. We'll try it, and then it, won't, and then it just doesn't go. They work for 20 to 30 minutes with me on that. By this time, Will gets back. Will's just sort of like, what is happening? <laughs> and, and, so, and then the one guy that was really tatted up now, I'm talking like painted, he, he, it's like he has an epiphany. And he goes back to his truck, gets a tool, comes back to the battery, does something, and I can see him through here. The hood's up, but I can see him right there. And he looks up at me and he goes, hit it. I mean, it fired. And it was, it was clear that that, that joker was not going to die again. And he looks at me with this big toothy grin. He's like, you good to go? And I was like, I get out. I was like, what would you do? He's like, the bat, they had tried to steal the battery. So the positive connector was, was loose. And so as movement would occur with the car, it would lose its charge and just go immediately totally dead. Okay. Quote, one of our favorite quotes from... Uh, Harper Lee's To Kill a Mockingbird. This is when Atticus is talking to Scout as she's trying to make sense of all the, all the racial upheaval that's going on in their little southern town. And Atticus, in his wisdom, looks at, down at her in that porch swing and says, Scout, you never really understand a person until you consider things from his point of view, until you climb into his skin and walk around in it for a while. I'll leave you with that. God bless you, and I appreciate the, the opportunity to, to be with you today.